Hey, well, good morning, good evening, good night, whenever it may be that you're watching this. We're glad that you're with us. If you're kind of part of the Norton community uh, here, glad that you can tune in this way. If you kind of just tune in with us online, we're glad that you're able to connect with us. We'd love to hear from you. If we can just pray for you, steer you in any direction, uh, we'd love to be helpful for you. In that way, today we close out the Sermon on the Mount. We said Jesus is his, his best work, kind of his most comprehensive teaching. We actually started this uh, February 18th, so we've been trekking through this uh, throughout the winter, spring, and into summer. And, and my challenge to you as we wrap this up today is I would challenge you to keep reading it, to keep soaking in it, to make this almost one of the songs that you keep on repeat as you walk with and follow Jesus. It's core and it's pillar to so much of what the New Testament teaches. This is the, the source material for it. I don't know about you, but I, lo- I love how things start and I love how things end, right? Like I, I love like the opening scene of a movie and the closing scene of a movie, right? Are like the most the two most important things in the movie, right? Like as a kid, you can remember that first day of summer, you know, sleeping in that first day and then that last day before you got to go back to school. Right, my a couple of my friends just went and saw um, a band we really like, and I'm like, I didn't go, but I said, what what song did they start with, and what was the last song they played? Right, it's just it's interesting, right? People come to church like, what time's church start? It's important. They really also want to know what time church gonna be over, right? What times this begin? What times this end? Right? Jesus opened the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, right? The 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 blesseds, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, the ones who hunger and thirst. Blessed are the meek, right? It was a unique beginning. It kind of captured your attention. It was kind of thought-provoking, right? And everybody loves a good, clean, like resolved ending, right? Like we love a storybook ending, kind of wrap this up, resolve on the, the, on the note of the key. Like we love that stuff. And Jesus does not do that here. Kind of started the ending last week where he gave us these three pictures. And today he gives us, us a fourth. Jesus is too creative. He's too intentional, he's too compelling to simply just wrap this up in a bow, but instead he challenges us. He tells us a simple story to let his hearers kind of connect the dots, to let those who hear, you and I, kind of contemplate our own lives and to feel the weight of what Jesus has been teaching us uh, as a church for the last four months. He ends it differently. And so what I want to do today is I just want to read this concluding passage uh, and, and, and kind of walk through it together, but I challenge you to do this. When you read through scripture, sometimes there's just little words that kind of bend, not bend, but the the, the weight of the meaning kind of weighs on that, that it, it holds on these certain little words. So if you've got your Bibles with your phones, maybe just pull out a pen, maybe it's your notes on your phone, and maybe it's just jotting down some of these uh, little words. Let's jump into this today. As we wrap up chapter 7 uh, and verse 24, Jesus says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Rain came, streams rose, the winds blew, and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. He said, he contrasts it, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is, a, is a, like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And he says this, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. If you got a little pencil in your hand, two words that I think stick out uh, in this first passage that I just kind of want to look at, I want to double click on uh, for the sake of today are practice and wisdom. This ten- uh, the Practice and wisdom, he says in verse 24 and then 26, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. I think just that word practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. In verse 26, everyone who hears the words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. This is so simple, yet it's so profound. Jesus is giving us kind of these, these, these two different individuals, these two houses, these two foundations, Kind of these two choices, right? Life is full of choices. 
Uh, right before this, Jesus talks about uh, true and false teachers, the narrow path and the wide path, true and false disciples, kind of these, these, these two different choices, right? These two different ways. Life is full of these two different ways. I remember my, when I was like 19 to 20, you know, you're kind of out of high school, figuring out what to do with the rest of your life. The girl you're dating, you're either going to break up with or you're going to marry, kind of wrestling with the realities of God, what you're going to do with school. Like I remember wrestling with these things, right? Uh, very much wrestling with all these kind of choices. And what I what I came to realize during that time is not everything, many things are, but not everything is, is just black and white, right and wrong, right? But many things are, are come down to, to, is it wise or is it unwise? And now that may to us kind of hit our ears like something like, oh, that, like optional, like you can kind of do this, you can do this, one's a little better, but it doesn't really matter. And I think that's a short understanding of it. Because all through the scripture, we see the weight of wisdom. Because wisdom is many times the way that God operates in our lives, right? There was a, a book I read during that period. It was called Just Do Something by an author named Kevin DeYoung. And in there, he said this, Obsessing over the future is not how God wants us to live. Because showing us the future is not God's way. I want him to show me the future. I want him to tell me all the right things. Marry this person, go to this school, do this. Just print it, right? His way is to speak to us through the scriptures and transform us by the renewing of our minds. His way is not a crystal ball. His way is wisdom. His way is wisdom, which is why it's so interesting that the wise man lives a certain way. The wise man puts th certain things into practice. The wise man walks a certain road. The wise man bears certain fruit, right? It's, it's not just simply right and wrong, but it's deeper than that. It's wisdom. At week one, we talked about how Jesus, as he's crafting this sermon, had these different influences, right? Because he was a human. He was a man. And one of his greatest influences would have been the, the tradition of Hebrew wisdom literature. So much of the scriptures is this, this tradition of wisdom. And we think of wisdom kind of as almost these tips and tricks, right? Like, like we Google wisdom. How to get through class. How Five steps to... That's an oversimplification of what wisdom is. Wisdom isn't just tips and tricks when we're talking about the depth of Scripture, but it's the way in which we aligned ourselves with God's way of flourishing in the world. It's tapping into the, the bloodstream of life, of wisdom. The Scriptures tell us that in wisdom, God created the world. That, that God's wisdom looks like foolishness to us. That Jesus Christ was the wisdom of God, right? That it's this way to wholeness, to true life with God, to the abundant life. Everything that we long for is walking in wisdom. Putting, it, putting into practice all these things Jesus has taught us for the last four months. All these things Jesus has taught. Putting them into practice isn't simply doing the right thing. Just do the right thing. That would be oversimplistic. That would boil it down. That would be a what's the thing I need to do to do the right thing to get where I want to go. It's different than that. It's more robust than that. It's more beautiful than that. It's more weighty than that. Because walking in wisdom requires all of us, not just a, a simple little thing. So the choice that Jesus is weighing out isn't what's the right thing, what's the wrong thing necessarily, though the scriptures are full of that. It's what's the wise thing in light of what Jesus is teaching. Now, I don't want to overcomplicate or over-spiritualize uh, what Jesus is instructing here, right? Jesus, Jesus' instruction, this little parable he gives us is actually incredibly simple, incredibly profound. And we see it all through the scriptures, right? Just this idea of put into practice what I say. Do what I say. Not as a parent pointing a finger, but as a way of wisdom. We see the prophet Ezekiel. My people come to you as they usually do, sit before you to hear your words but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. We see it in the Old Testament, the prophets, then Jesus' brother James kind of reflects Sermon on the Mount. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. We see this all through the scriptures, right? But we also see this all through our, through our own lives, right? Like hearing something and then actually doing it are two different things. And Jesus is just simply saying, if you hear the right way, if you hear the, the path to life and, and you don't do it, it's foolish. But if you hear the path to life, that choice isn't just simply the right thing, it's wise. It's the way that leads to life and life abundant. We see this all through our lives. Uh, I drive a lot of beater cars have kind of been my thing. And oftentimes with my cars, 
I want to see how far I can go and not spend money. Right? You're like, how far can I get this car to go before I got to put a couple bucks in it, right? And that usually leads to a lot of things, right? You can't drive very far. Uh, sometimes with brakes, you just got to start braking earlier. When you're getting off the highway, just start braking earlier. You know, you can make, you can save that money for a minute. Don't take car tips from me, right? But oftentimes with, with my car, it's like, I just want to see how far I can make it, right? But my mechanic thinks differently. I'm a great mechanic, right? He's not trying to get money out of me. He's, he's great and he wants my car to run. He wants me to be able to take my kids places, to arrive there safely, to in the long run not have to spend a bunch of money on something I should have fixed earlier, right? Like there, there's something, I can, I can know these things, but there's something to just doing it. Knowing that that's the right thing for the longevity of my car, the safety of my family, just doing it, right? We see this play out through the scriptures, we see it play out through our lives. What Jesus is laying out is the difference between just simple information, knowing about something, information, letting it transform us, letting it change us, letting it, let, letting it turn us into something else. Now, information is important, so important, right? Jesus was a teacher. He spent three chapters teaching and challenging, informing, reframing. Like he, was, he was giving us information on how to live. Dan talked about this last week. Jesus, right before he walks into this final parable, talks about the the importance of our doctrine, our theology. Right belief is essential. It's, it's so important. Like what is under the hood of the car is of utmost importance. An engine inside of the hood of a car is not like a fluid, we can kind of decide what it's gonna be. It's an important concrete thing, right? But it's not the end goal. Because the Pharisees through the scriptures, they had great, they, they had a lot, of, a lot of knowledge in theology, but they missed the end goal of it playing out in their lives. The, the book of James tell us demons have great theology. They know much more about the Bible than you do, but they haven't put this into practice, right? It's like just knowing this stuff is not enough. Information isn't enough. It's about transformation. Uh, growing up, uh, when I was middle school, early high school, I had a, played in some bands. I was the drummer. That was fun. Bigger targets on the drums. But I really wanted to play guitar. Like, guitar players were cool. And all my friends played guitar. And we, one of my good friends, before we had our license and could go places, we would sit at my parents' kitchen counter. And we used to get a music catalog called Musician's Friend. And we'd flip through Musician's Friend, and he, he was a guitar player, and he would teach me all about the guitars. Like, I knew so much about guitars. Fenders and Gibsons and Les Pauls and all, the, all these things. I knew all about these guitars. I would go to guitar center, I could tell you all of them. I could tell you different models, I could tell you which ones were nice, I could tell you which ones were cheap, I could tell you which ones certain people played. Knew so much about guitars, but I, I could not play the guitar. I, I couldn't play. I actually loved when my friends would be on worship team, they'd be like, hey, can you bring the guitar from your house I left? Because I got to carry the guitar case, and I felt pretty cool with that guitar case, but I couldn't play the guitar, right? Like, I had all the information about it, but it didn't change me at all. Formation, what Jesus is talking about, putting these things into practice. Formation is the way that we are changed to become like Jesus. This is what discipleship is. Discipleship isn't simply just going through a book with somebody for a couple months and then carrying on with our lives. That's not what discipleship is. Discipleship is deeply being changed, loving and following, becoming more and more like Jesus, putting into practice what he taught, not just in our, in our minds, but with our hearts, our souls, our mind, our strength. Uh, James K.A. Smith is an author. He writes all about this. I love this. He says this, Jesus is a teacher who doesn't just inform our intellect, but forms our very loves. He isn't just content to simply deposit new ideas into our minds. He is after nothing less than your wants, your loves, and your longings. This is why all through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is not simply just telling us what to do. Just do these things and then you can go. No, that's why Jesus is getting to the heart of the matter. That's why he says, you've heard it said, don't kill, but I say, don't hate. It's in the heart of, of what you care about. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm saying, don't even lust. It's the depth of your heart. He said, the oaths you make, your, your promise, your word, your commitments, your anxieties, the depth of your prayers, all these things that Jesus is after. This is why taking every thought captive matters. This is why the voices that we listen to, we talked about last week, matters. That's why things like Jesus taught fasting, holding ourselves back from things matters. 
That's why turning off the news sometimes, getting off the news feed sometimes matters because Jesus is calling us to some big stuff. He's calling us to forgive our enemies, to not hold hate in our hearts, to mean the words that we say, to store up our treasures in heaven as a give away our earthly ones, to see our brokenness as blessedness, to resist the urge and anxieties that our world insists are necessary. And if we don't put these things into practice in the small ways, how will we weather the storm that Jesus is talking about in the big ways? And the question that I often have as I read things like this, because Jesus in, in his teaching says, the wise man puts it into practice. The foolish man doesn't put it into practice. The wise man does what I say. The fool does not do what I say. It, it begs this question for me. As I go to my mechanic, as I, as I listen to the words of Jesus, why am I oftentimes more motivated to just simply figure out what is required of me? rather than trusting that this life that Jesus lays out is actually good. What if this life that is built on the rock is actually deeply satisfying, good, and true? As Jesus tells us later on in Matthew, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my way of life, my, my work, take it upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When Jesus says the wise person puts these things into practice, and later on in the book of Matthew, when he says, my, my, my yoke is easy and light, learn from me, those aren't two different things. He's not like, hey, here's a way of life, and then here's a yoke. This is nice, that's hard. These are the same things. It's not just simply, what do I got to do, Jesus? What do you, is this what I got to do? Okay, I'll do that. No, no, no. It's this, 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 this yoke, this way of life that will give rest to our souls. But I don't think we always see it this way. I think we create these dichotomies that aren't always helpful. Is it the law or is it grace? Is it works or is it faith? Is it all grace or is it all you? And we can kind of set up these different theological camps, or maybe it's even just a camp in my brain. But they're asking the same question. They're actually very similar. What must I do? What is the minimum entry requirement to get to heaven? And what that does is it fails to see that these lives, these, that the life and teachings of Jesus is good and beautiful and true. And both of these camps can fail to see the abundant life that Jesus offers. But the way that Jesus is offering, this way of wisdom, this way of deep life, the way that we experience grace and life abundant is by practice, is by abiding, is by walking with Jesus, is by doing what he taught, by not just looking at the guitars and the magazine, but learning to play and make music. You can't be forced into it. No one can force you into this life. No one can trick you into this life. You cannot be guilted into this. Or you can't be marketed into this, right? It's an invitation that is yours for the taking. And it takes a lifetime of studying, practicing, tripping and standing back up, being corrected, inviting others along, but most of all, primarily, solely, it takes Jesus being the rock at the center. He goes on, a couple more words that stick out as he goes on. It's almost these, these different elements that, that come our way that Jesus talks about and the integrity of our foundation. Look at uh, 25 through 27. The rain came down. The streams rose and the winds blew. He talks about the rain, the streams, and the wind. And they blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Rain came down, streams rose, winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. I think it's interesting, these elements that come our way, wind and rain and the streams that rise up, these different elements that all of us experience. These, one, are some just these realities that we all struggle with, that are just the realities of this world. We live in a sinful, broken world, yet God uses these things to test, to strengthen our faith. Jesus is honest about the reality of things. Rain's gonna come for us all. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. It's going to rain on all of us. We live in Ohio, ladies and gentlemen, right? 
both these houses, both these builders, the rain was going to come, right? Weathering is simply a reality of life, a consequence of the fall, but it's used for our strengthening. That's why James says, you've heard this a thousand times, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing, the rain that comes, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. He says, let that perseverance finish its work so you may be mature and complete, so your faith may be built up, not lacking in anything. I heard this term this week in a book I was reading called anti-fragile. Anti-fragile. And he says, you know, there's some things that are fragile. You got to be careful. If a wine glass falls off, it's going to shatter. It's fragile, right? And there's some things that are just tough, right? There's just things that are like, it's not going to break. It's plastic. It's fine. But he says, then there's things that are anti-fragile that actually become stronger as you press against them, right? Uh, our, our immune systems are this way, right? Like, you can have a weak immune system, but your, your immune system gets stronger as it's tested, right? Right, that's why when we came out of the lockdown years ago, we all, there was like a season where just every kid in the world was sick, right? Because you didn't have all those things from school that you would have got over the last year, right? That's anti-fragile, that it's the, it's the beating against it that gets stronger, right? Uh, this author would say, uh, children are that way, right? That as, as we raise our children, that their experiences as they fall, as they fail, as they wrestle, that it builds up character, right? It, it Hard situations cause them to understand and get wisdom on how to navigate the next situation, like anti-fragile, right? That it's strengthened by the elements. This, this author tells the story that I've, I've told before. Uh, there, was a, there was a college, I forget what it was, that kind of was doing some studies and they made this biome. And in this biome, they're representing the realities of nature. So all these different flora and fauna, right? So they could study things in this biome, right? This kind of enclosed um, environment. And something that they noticed was all these trees started falling down. They had these trees in there. They had all the, you know, as close to the conditions as they could. And all these different trees just started falling down. And what their studies showed was that the reason these trees were falling down was because their roots weren't going deep. And their roots didn't have to go deep because there's no wind blowing against the trees. And as the wind blows against the trees, the roots go deeper and it creates this strength, this, this, this anti-fragileness, right? Our faith is the same way. That these storms that come, these winds that blow, aren't just things that we have to get through, but they're things that make our faith stronger. That some of these, these winds, these streams, these, these rains are things that come against us from the outside. But the second thing is some of it is, is stuff that comes from inside. Our own sin that comes from inside of us that we have to weather, that our faith is built up by as we navigate, process, confess, and walk through our own sin. I have the, the privilege to do... Uh, to marry couples. I love the opportunity to sit with a couple, to get to talk through uh, just how the gospel plays in the marriage and, and get to, to marry them. And one of the things uh, we'll talk about is I'll, I'll kind of ask the question, what do you want your, your, your marriage to look like in 20 years? What do you want your kids to say about your marriage? And we'll draw that on the board. And then we'll kind of draw from here to there. And we're like, what are the things that it takes to get there? If your kids say that my parents' marriage is strong and it's built on love and trust, what are the things that take to get there? And then I ask this question, what are the things that'll kind of be bumps along the way, things that'll come against you as you work your way towards the 20, 25 year mark? And, and people say, you know, many things that we would expect, you know, money challenges, sickness, uh, loss, job loss, like these things that'll weather against us. Very true, very hard for marriage, right? But then I always make them uncomfortable and I ask this question. I say, yes, those things are hard. But there sometimes with external things is an element of we can hold hands and make it through that external thing together. Where, where marriage truly is tested, and you know this to be true, any relationship is truly tested, is by the things that come from within. Our, our sin that comes from us that harms the other person. Both of us can get, get through this season together. But what about when I'm the one that hurts you? What about when one of you says something that is deeply hurtful? What about when one of you struggles with pornography and you have to navigate that? What about when one of you befriends someone at work unintentionally and that relationship grows more than, than what it should? What about when one of you has a mental health struggle, right? This is when the wind really batters against the house is when it comes from within us. 
And whether it's in a marriage or in our own faith, the things that come from within us, our own doubts, our own anxieties, our own struggles, our own sin, is weather that builds across the house. And if it's built in sand, it's going to wash away. The elements will wash it away. This foundation, there's no integrity, no structural integrity. But if it's built on the rock, these elements from without or from within, Will, will, will not crumble the, the, the house because it's built on a strong foundation. Whether it's from without or from within, all of us will face what some church fathers called a dark night of the soul. A dark night of the soul. Maybe that's a loss that, that brings the abstract reality of God into a, a wrestle at the forefront of our lives. Maybe it's a crisis of faith where you or someone close to you see just the sandy foundations erode. The kind of trite, nice little Bible band-aids just fade away and you have a crisis of faith. When maybe you experience deep hurt from people that were supposed to be the people of God and they've hurt you deeply. You know, the, the modern phrase that we use is deconstruction. When you start to take apart all the things that you thought were true, where the deep, deep questions loom heavy on our hearts. You see, the, the, if you've walked through this, these could be dark nights of the soul. We say, where are you, God? But what if these dark nights of the soul aren't in spite of our faith, but are for the ultimate strengthening of our faith? Because it's easier to go through life and just say, yep, yep, God's in control, and just keep building our house on sand. But when we walk through these dark nights of the soul, of loss, of anguish, that we see what our actual foundation was, the integrity of our actual foundation. David in the Psalms, you see this darkness, these dark nights of the soul as he navigates in the Psalms. We see Paul had, a, there was a thorn in his flesh, a, a wrestle, right? That we see Peter failing miserably before Jesus. These dark nights of the soul reveal our, our deep foundation. What if these things are meant for the strengthening of our faith? Because it's worth asking, is our, is our foundation, what we actually believe, what we're putting our faith in, not just for the uh, eternity, yes, for eternity, but for right now as well? Are we, are we just putting them in a, a theological camp, like just kind of a, a group, right? Are we putting them in a particular leader? Like uh, many times our foundation can be built on what that person teaches. And when that person, when their faith crumbles, when they fall, when they change, then we don't know what to do, right? Is it this, this kind of Jesus tinged life plan that I want things to go this way? And when they don't, when we are grossly awakened by the pain of the reality of life that we're just lost, is it a leader, a relationship, just an ideal outcome that we were actually building our lives upon? I think the, the last handful of years from elections to pandemics and everything in between has showed us, hopefully has shown you what your foundation is actually built on. If it was built on the rock of Jesus or if it's built on sand of politics and ideologies and good feelings and pleasure, that we see what it was actually built on. Because if we're talking about life, death, heaven, hell, actual life that is life, abundant relationships of following this God, the creator, if I'm talking about my actual life, I want something concrete. I want a hope that's bigger than the way I feel. Because you know what? I feel different every 15 seconds. I want a foundation that's bigger than just the way I feel. I want a truth that didn't get cooked up on the internet in the last 15 years. I don't want just a truth that was like, yeah, we kind of came up with this this week. I want something that's solid. I want a truth that's lasting. I want an assurance that's deeper than my ability to make my feel, myself feel good about a situation. Man, our minds can convince us of anything. We can make ourselves feel good about anything we've said or done, but in the depth, in the back of our hearts, we know that it's wrong. I want an assurance that's deeper than just what I can convince myself of. I want a reality that can withstand my own doubts, that doesn't fall apart when I ask a couple hard questions. I need a God who is ancient, who is unattainable, who is unshaken, but if he could deal with my human inadequacies and if I could just be honest and be near to him, that would be much preferred as well. I don't want a God that I'm comfortable with. I don't want a God who's manageable, who's mapped out, who sits in like a little book who I can put where I want. I want a God who is fierce. I want a foundation that is solid. And that is what we see in the teachings and in the life of Jesus. If Jesus is just cute to you, I'm sorry. 
if Christianity is just kind of a radio station and a publication company that makes you feel good for a hard day, I'm sorry. Because when the dark night of the soul comes, when the elements, when the streams rise, when the rain beats from within, without, I want a foundation that's not going to shake. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. And what's amazing is at the end of this sermon, the last, the last part of this sermon, when Jesus had finished, this, this ain't part of the sermon, this is postscript. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed. Amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. John Stott, we've kind of referenced him throughout this series, he says this. So the main question that this sermon forces on us is not so much what do you make of this teaching as who on earth is this teacher? It's not so what do you do with this, this helpful information, but it's who, who is this teacher? They were amazed at his authority. Now you may kind of buck at the word authority because you're thinking about authoritativeness. Because it's easy, it's easy for someone to be unamazingly authoritative, right? We've all had that boss, right? They were authoritative, but we weren't amazed by them. There's a difference between authoritativeness and authority. Think about the people in your life that, that, that you admire, respect, that carry authority. As a parent, teacher, coach, whatever. That authority, it, it includes knowledge and expertise, right? Because we ask that question, like, do you know what you're talking about? Like, a th true authority carries with it knowledge. And, like, do you know, right? These people saw the authority of Jesus. Authority includes almost this action, this, this ownership of something. Do, do you actually do what you say? Do you, will you actually show up? Will this actually work, right? But I think authority that is amazing requires relationship and understanding. Do you actually care about me? You can be authoritative. You can tell me what to do. And we've been saying this every week. If you hear the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus saying, go do it, just go. You'll grit it out. You'll grit it out. But you will be amazed by the authority of Jesus when you see that he knows what he's talking about. He has showed up and he cares for you. That Jesus' authority doesn't come from just the outside authoritativeness, do what I say, but his authority comes from taking that and stepping in, being with us, dying for us, maintaining relationship with us through the power of his spirit. His authority is not from without, but it's from within. And that's what changes this entire sermon we've been saying the whole time, is if we don't look to the preacher of the sermon, we will miss the whole thing. That these people were amazed because they were looking at Jesus. They were hearing the words of Jesus. They were struck with the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus are what are amazing and authoritative because Jesus is not just giving us suggestions on how to live, but he's telling us how the system works because he's the authority on it. C.S. Lewis said this years ago. He said, God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol. That's how they say gas in the UK. And it would not run properly on anything else. Now God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the food that our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. That is why it is just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering with him. He said, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. Because Jesus is the authority. He's the authority because he made us. But he's the authority because he loves us. This teaching, this, this putting these things into practice as a wise man is an invitation to life and life to the full. And if we reject, if we reject the teachings of the creator, the way of life that the creator has laid out, we're foolish. Foolish. Oftentimes, I feel like we think about the, the, the authority of Jesus. And sometimes we can find our authority in different places. Sometimes I think of, 
almost like a, a rock climbing wall. You ever seen a rock climbing wall? Where you, you gotta grab this piece to get to this piece to get to this piece. And if one of these pieces don't work, then the rest of it is unattainable. And oftentimes, what we start with is we start with the, 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 the foundational thing is the authority of the Bible. And so we think if we can convince someone the Bible is true, we have to spend our whole lives convincing you that the Bible is true. Then we might be able to convince you that Jesus was real. And if we can convince you that Jesus is real, maybe you'll believe his message. And if maybe you believe his message, then maybe you'll, and, and we kind of make these rocks, right? And while that, that's a, a helpful picture, I, I think it lays out different. Jesus isn't one of these rocks that we grab onto. Jesus is the rock wall. He's the, he's the thing which everything else attaches to. All things have been created through him and for him. Jesus says the scriptures, the, the Bible, it's authoritative because it testifies about him. It points us to him. It's in Jesus, the actual rock that we live, move, and have our being. And if we see the authority of Jesus as just a rock on a wall, we miss the fact that Jesus is the wall. He is the one in which everything else is attached to. Everything else is built upon. He is the chief cornerstone. He is the center of all things. And so I just, want to, and I just want to ask you a couple questions today. As we wrap up this series, I would encourage you, challenge you, continue, continue to read through this message. The question I would ask you is just simply this. What, what is your plan? What is your plan for putting Jesus' teachings into practice? He, said, he says, the wise man, here's my words, puts them into practice. It's like a man who builds his house on a rock. What is your plan for putting these things into practice? What does that look like tangibly, concretely in your life? Because many times, the teachings of Jesus were like, yeah, that's all good. It's all out here in the ether, but then we got to go to work. We got to take care of kids. We got to pay bills. We got to have conversations. We got to eat breakfast. What is your plan for following Jesus? Not out here, but in those things. I'm not asking you if you're a type A planner who puts everything on a spreadsheet or if you're kind of a go with the flow person. We all plan for things. You have a plan to pay your bills. You have a plan to eat this week. You have a plan of what you're going to do today. You have some rough plan about what your future looks like. And my question is, if we want to build our house on the rock, and if you, I don't want to assume you do, if you believe that building, our, building your house on the rock is the wise way to live, not just here and now, but for final judgment, what's your plan for following Jesus? Because the things that we just assume will happen, they won't happen. We should get together sometime. It's not going to happen unless you put a date in your calendar. I, that's what I'd say. I, I'd write it down. Write it down. Share it with, a, with a, a group of people. And then hold each other accountable to it. Man, what, what does it look like to follow Jesus in my relationships? I want to prioritize relationships. And so there's family members I want to reach out to. There's my three that I want to pray for. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. These are the things I'm going to pray for. Man, I, do, I don't want to be a slave to my money. I want to store up treasures in heaven, not treasures on earth. I want to I want, to, I want to tithe. I want to give away. I want to be generous. I want to be a happy giver who gives to other people what Jesus has given to me. Okay, what's your plan for that? How much is it going to be? How are you going to do it? What organization are you going to give to? What's your tithe going to look like? Who are you going to bless with your money? What, what stuff you have? You're going to, what's your plan? Right? Man, I, I, don't, I don't want adultery. I, I, I know that, that he says don't commit adultery, but I don't want lust in my heart. Okay, what's your plan? What, what things are on your phone to block things? Who are you talking to about it? I don't, I don't want hate to seep up in my heart. Okay, what, what things are creating, creating anger in your heart? Which thing, what things are you taking in that are creating bitterness the way you look at people? What's your plan for following Jesus? Part of your plan for following Jesus may be like, I'm, I'm going to get off. I, what is your plan for following Jesus? I go on all day about this, right? Putting these things into practice. Well, G, Aiden, isn't that being legalistic? If that's how you see it. If that's how you see it, you aren't pleasing God by doing these things. You are walking in wisdom with Christ by putting into practice, by taking his invitation, by, by fixing our eyes on the preacher, by walking with Jesus, putting these things into practice. Then I ask you this, who or what is the authority in your life? What, is, what or who is the grid by which you make decisions, the voice that you listen to? And, and, and this is how I would ask you how, do you, how do you know if it's Jesus? If you're like, I think the authority is Jesus. I, I, think, I think the authority of my life is Jesus. How do you know? Look at your actual life. 
you don't, you don't have a spiritual life and a physical life and a financial life and a relational life and a sex life and a work life. You have a life. Look at your life. Look at your life. Or the people around you, look at your life. Is Jesus the authority in it? Who calls the shots? Who gives you your sense of identity? Who is the basis of truth? Where do your, your values come from? There, as a pastor, I, there's this gift of, of doing funerals, of getting a part, getting to be a part of, of funerals. And, and this is what I mean. Because at funerals, you, you see so clearly what someone's life was built upon. What the authority of someone's life was. Just recently, we had a, a funeral service. Sometimes I'll do the funeral. Sometimes I'll help with just the stuff at the church sit in the back, the tech booth, if you need help there, performing the service, whatever. And I was sitting in the back while uh, Pastor Jonathan was doing a, a funeral recently for a, a man. And his daughter and some friends uh, got up and spoke spoke of this man's life. And they spoke of his genuineness and his honesty and his gentleness and his patience and his humor and his thoughtfulness. And he was a man who built his life upon Christ. And you can tell at a funeral when you're like, yeah, he was, we got to find some nice stuff to say. That, that's, everybody has, you know, nice things to say. That's, that's fine. But you can tell when someone has built their life upon the authority and goodness of Jesus. Because you hear it come out in the way people talk about this person. The fruit of their life was for the sake of other people. That they lived, not just they lived the right way, yes, but they lived a wise life fruitful, full life in Christ. Not just a happy life, not just a pleasant life, not an easy life, not an entertaining life, but a deep, wise, fruitful life that was invested for the sake of others and for the sake of the kingdom. What will you do with this teaching? What will you do with what Jesus taught? Let's pray together. Jesus, I pray that you would help us that you would challenge us, that you would encourage us, Jesus. We don't want to just simply do the right thing. We want to fix our eyes on you, the rock, and seek you and follow you and know you and be transformed by you. We don't want to just know about the right things to do, but Jesus, we want to seek you. And so I pray that you'd transform us deeply. I pray that you would expose the, the flimsy foundations the sandy things that wash away. So quickly, Jesus, we try to just find things that float in the storm to hold on to. And Jesus, we want to build a house that lasts. And so I pray that you'd help us to inspect our lives, our decisions, our finances, our loves, our passions, our desires, the things that we think about, the things that we meditate on, the things that we hope for, the things that we long for, Jesus, that you would help us to realign these things, to be in line with your wisdom and your way of life. I pray, Jesus, that your teachings would continue to play in our hearts and play in our souls as we seek to follow you. It's because of Christ we pray. Amen.